welcome again. Uh, if you're here, it is because of two reasons. Either you didn't attend my previous talk, or I didn't, you actually attended and enjoyed it, and I didn't scare you enough that you decided to, to show up uh, for, uh, for this second talk. So this is like having um, dual personality, right? My first talk about decentralized AI was very theoretical. Uh, we talk about a lot of, you know, cryptography, blockchains, federated learning, a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of um, uh, very theoretical stuff. In this session, it's all practical. This is for companies that are impl implementing deep learning solutions, machine learning solutions in the real world. Some of the lessons we have discovered with uh, in large implementations with customers that are not very obvious and that you don't find in the in the literature um, uh, out there. So let me switch back uh, to to my screen here. Again, if um, if you missed the the first section, the first session, a quick intro. My name is Jesus Rodriguez. I'm the chief scientist and founder of Invector Labs. So you can think about Invector Labs, a next generation um, consultant firm, but with two main caveats. Uh, one is uh, the focus, right? We focus exclusively on deep tech, AI, blockchain, uh, crypto, cybersecurity, those type of things that sit at the intersection of uh, heavy computer science and practical applications. And two is the, the, the structure that we use a very high, large network of uh, high talented freelancers in, in uh, all these uh, on all these spaces, people with uh, PhDs in math and professors at university, and, and we assemble assemble teams dynamically to deliver projects for uh, for companies. So we're working with some very very high profile organizations, mostly in North America, across m m um, many different areas, mostly. Um, Artificial intelligence and blockchain technologies cover, uh, account for about 80% of what we do. I'm also, I do a lot of uh, speaking engagements throughout the year. Uh, I write almost every day on that blog and I'm a contributor to several publications. I'm an investor in over a dozen uh, tech companies and sit at the board um, of a few others. And uh, the session, the title of this session is AI Patents and Anti-Patents. But the other day somebody told me that I should use a better title uh, that is a few things in this time, uh, in this case, 15 lessons I wish I would have known before scaling deep learning solutions. And this is a better title. It's a better title because we're going to talk about 15 very practical lessons we have encountered on the implementation of deep learning solutions that it, it's really hard to find those out there unless you actually go through this. Uh, it's one of those things that hit you in the face. Uh, I, and you're not thinking about it, and, and uh, it, it uh, both technologically and in terms of methodologies and processes. So this session is completely practical. We're going to talk about the challenges of scaling uh, deep learning solutions and go one by one through those 15 lessons and propose some solutions of how we deal with those issues. We're monitoring the chat, so at any given point, ask questions. This is very practical. Uh, I'm sure there is a lot of room for debate and we're, we're monitoring the chat. So just to uh, hear some um, case studies of some of the, the customers we're working with, we're working with one of the biggest uh, railroad companies in the in the U.S. doing the scenarios are car load, uh, pre, uh, power maintenance and car load predictions. We're working with a quant hedge fund in uh, uh, Chicago doing simulations for uh, for training uh, industries, a hospitality group, we're analyzing a volume of a large volume of reviews across many websites. A legal software vendor in New York, we're doing things for for e discovery. So all these lessons come from practical uh, suffering through uh, uh, practical applications, uh, uh, trying to scale this type of solutions. The key things you're going to learn in this session: two things. One is Implementing deep learning solutions at scale requires a new type of infrastructure. That is not what most organizations have today. And also a new type of architecture. So we, and we're going to see how this architecture takes, uh, takes place. So the first question that we need to ask ourselves is, what is so challenging about all this stuff? Like what makes deep learning uh, so, so difficult? So there are many, many, many factors. Uh, one that I, the, uh, a way that I think about, I like to explain this to people is 
the life cycle of deep learning solutions is very different from what uh, what we see in typical software applications. So uh, typically you do uh, some, whether you're using agile or waterfall or test driven development or whatever, you create some, uh, some code, you deploy it, you test it, and you go through that life cycle. In deep learning, we have many a different life cycle in which you do a lot of experimentation, create the model, you need to do this thing, it's called training, like what the heck is that? Then you deploy, you all regularize and optimize, and you go back and it's an never ending cycle, right? So it never, uh, you never end uh, to train and, and optimize the, the models. And then there is there are some very tangible challenges here. So one that in, in theory is called the curse of dimensionality. That is the fact that uh, deep learning models operate in many dimensions, where humans, we were very good uh, to cognitively process information in three dimensions, but uh, any deep learning model can be processed in hundreds of dimensions. And how do you understand problems at that at that level? Then there is this challenge of overfitting and underfitting in which you optimize too much uh, a model for a specific data set, or you're not able to produce any meaningful model for a specific data set. Then interpretability, like most of these programs, uh, you don't you don't know what how they're doing what they're doing. The other day, somebody was showing me uh, a model that was making some um, uh, uh, predictions for uh, for a specific hotel. So I cannot talk too much about the scenario. And I I saw something very very clever the way he was grouping hotels. And I asked the data scientist, "Oh, this is incredibly clever. How did it do that?" And the answer was like, "No idea." Right, like this is, uh, it's really hard to figure out how these programs are doing uh, what they're doing. And then uh, the, the bias and variance problems in which we deal with a lot of preconception on the on the data set. Uh, and it's really hard to, to factor in, to quantify how much that is influencing the, the decisions. So implementing deep learning in the enterprise is brutally difficult. So it's like nothing I've ever seen before. You're dealing with very early technologies that are in a very early life cycle. The tool sets are not there. You need to put a lot of processes and, and robust architecture uh, practices to deliver this type of solutions at scale. If you're a company working in this space, you probably recognize uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about. You're, you're faced with challenges every step of the way. But this is not because of the obvious reasons, right? There is the whole, you know, deep learning is complex, it's mathematically intense, there is a lot of talent, uh, you know, it's all Python. It, it, there are all sorts of the obvious reasons why we think this is complex. Let's talk about the non-obvious one, the ones that hit you in the face uh, during, the, during the life cycle of a project and some of the ones that we, um, uh, that we discover. So the rest of this presentation, what I'm going to do is to go through those 15 lessons and propose some solutions and hopefully get some, uh, some of your feedback. Uh, so these are 15 lessons about how do you implement uh, deep learning solutions at scale. Lesson number one, data scientists make horrible engineers. Many companies believe, assemble data science team and have those guys writing production code. And what I found out is that data scientists are extremely good at experimentation, but they have no idea how to write high quality code. They don't think about test cases. They don't think about refactoring. They don't think about scalability. So all those things are, are very, very, it's like culturally a different universe, right? And then it's very, very common that you have data science team writing experimentation or testing data models in languages that are not what you're gonna use for production. So for instance, Facebook, is uh, very notorious for doing a lot of their experimentation using PyTorch, while a lot of the production code is written in Cafe. And we have scenarios in which PyTorch, which is a language that is very good for experimentation, is what data scientists use. And then we take the same model and, and implement it using TensorFlow or something that is more production ready. So what's a possible uh, solution here? So consider dividing your team into uh, different uh, different groups. So the data science team, pure data science, uh, they, those guys write Jupyter notebooks for uh, experimenting uh, with models. Then you have uh, what many organizations call something like the data engineering team. So these guys take the models and actually make it production ready. And making a production ready could entail many times just rewriting the whole thing. Uh, and, and then there is the DevOps that know how to monitor, how do you retrain these things periodically? How do you write the scripts for the training? 
jobs, how do you uh, optimize uh, the models, regularize the models? Those are different skill sets. Uh, we're fortunate at Invector Labs that we have some people that can cross cut, uh, at least between data scientists and, and data engineering teams, and those are few and far between. Uh, typically, the guys that understand AI research that are up to date with the latest uh, deep learning uh, research techniques and all that, they're not the same guys that know uh, how to uh, scale a Docker cluster in AWS uh, with uh, with deep learning models. So th those are different uh, uh, different skill sets. So lesson number two, if you are in the deep learning space, you're gonna live and die using notebooks. And until the other day, I was under the, the um, idea that notebooks didn't scale. Uh, notebooks were really good to experiment and write interactive code. And then if a couple of months ago, I came across a couple of things that Netflix has been doing in this space that made me rethink the entire, uh, my entire approach and discovered that notebooks actually do scale pretty well if, if uh, deployed in the right uh, infrastructure. So the common wisdom is uh, you use Jupyter, Zeppelin, those type of things for experimenting, writing IPython code on, on your favorite uh, deep learning framework, then you take uh, the code and package it as a Docker container and deploy it to a Kubernetes cluster and scale that. So for instance, if you're in AWS, you're gonna write your code in MXNet or TensorFlow and then deploy it, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in SageMaker with a, uh, uh, with a Jupyter Notebook and then deploy it to the AWS container service. If you're in Azure, you're gonna be using Azure ML and then deploy it to the Azure container service. However, and, and that's pretty much uh, true, However, there is some technologies in specifically paper mail, and this technology, uh, Netflix open source called uh, Maison, that they uh, that are very good for scaling uh, uh, notebooks in production. So paper, paper mail solved the issue of parameterizing notebooks, of being able to execute notebooks with a specific parameters. And Maison is really good at a scaling this thing. So I recently wrote a blog post about this, about how Netflix, I think it's called inside the Netflix uh, notebook architecture or something like this, about how Netflix is using this technology uh, to essentially make notebooks the, uh, the, the, the core of their uh, machine learning uh, infrastructure. So you can actually uh, productionalize the code in notebooks if, if architected correctly and scale it uh, very well. So lesson number three, many organizations, they like to go through this exercise of evaluating multiple deep learning frameworks and say like, we are a TensorFlow shop, we are a cafe shop, and we use SageMaker for the runtime or what have you. That's a fallacy. The, the fact of the matter is, is if your company is big enough, before you know it, you're gonna have different teams at different organizations experimenting with different frameworks uh, that are better suited for their cultural preferences or their, uh, their skill sets. So most likely, if you're in the enterprise architecture team, you need to figure out a way to coexist, uh, to live in an environment in which you have multiple deep learning uh, frameworks. And that, that's just a fact. Like it's really, really hard to standardize uh, in this world. So the way we tend to think about this, is as much as possible, you try to provide a consistent infrastructure that works uh, uh, that works across um, uh, all the all, all the different uh, all the different frameworks. Um, so if you think about things like training, monitoring, how do you extract features, all those capabilities can be abstracted using a consistent uh, infrastructure. And then you can do your model development using PyTorch, Cafe, MXNet, CNTK, whatever, uh, whatever you prefer, but your features are gonna live in a specific database. You're, uh, you're gonna use the same tools for hyperparameter optimizations. You're gonna use the same jobs architecture for training and things like that. And, and that gives you a certain level of consistency, which is important. Uh, to enforce because if not, you have this technologically fragmented 
environment in which everybody is consuming data however they want, writing code without following the standards, everybody uses their own processes and architecture for training and all that, and it's really hard, really hard to maintain. Um, so the other, another lesson is that training is not a one-off uh, exercise. So if you're coming from the academy, uh, is uh, you've read all these research papers in which, uh, oh, we train the data set, uh, you will train this model using this data set, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. And the fact of the matter is that training almost never ends. So you train a model uh, using a specific data set, you deploy it uh, to production, and before you know it, the thing is uh, outputting uh, stupid predictions or whatever, so you have to go back and figure out how do you train it, retrain it, and it's a constant exercise. There is a theorem in uh, deep learning, machine learning, that is called the no free lunch theorem that essentially said that with enough time and enough data, or over a, almost an infinite, infinite space of data and time, no model is better than any of the other models. So it's a way to say models that perform really well for one specific type of data, they could perform incredibly poorly for others. So that's why ensemble learning is such a uh, such a popular thing, right? Because you can take uh, the same models and uh, a group of models and, and uh, compose them together into an ensemble uh, that can perform well across different uh, different types of uh, data set. So the potential solution here is to take the time to automate the training jobs. I cannot tell you how many times we run into scenarios in which a data science, we're about to go to production, we look at a Jupyter notebook and the training code is written right there, right? It's, it's part of the notebook, so now you have to go through the exercise of uh, removing that code and make it a separate scripts and all that. Take the time to write your training jobs on your specific, you know, whether it's Python or whatever language, and then use uh, your favorite scheduler to automate those training jobs recurrently. Probably they pull data from your data lake and they're training the models on a regular basis. And then obviously you need to monitor the performance of the model to make sure that the training is doing what it's supposed uh, to be doing. Uh, I hope this is making sense. So if it, you know, you can acknowledge on the on the chat. Uh, if you have any questions, don't, don't hesitate to to ask. Uh, lesson number five, this is, this is an interesting one. So we tend to think about training as a centralized exercise. So, uh, and for the most part, that's what, what most uh, organizations do. So uh, you take a data set, you take a model, you train it, uh, you output uh, uh, a new model, and that's what, what you're gonna be running with. Now, if you have a large, the first time I came across this was following some of the work that the Uber, the engineering team at Uber uh, was doing. So if you think about a company like Uber, they have many, many data science teams producing models all the time. So a simple application like Uber Eats uh, uses about 100 machine learning uh, models to, to accomplish their different tasks. Performing the training of all those models at the same time concurrently is really, really hard, very compute, uh, compute, um, computational expensive. Uh, and then you have all these issues about what I mentioned, data scientists embedding the logic of training as part of the same uh, notebooks, training jobs are taking forever to execute, and then they're blocking uh, other training jobs for uh, from the starting and things like that. So actually the Uber team built a technology called Horobot uh, that is in the references. That is a distributed training architecture for TensorFlow. So they use uh, massive parallel computing infrastructure, MPC uh, infrastructure to take in a training job, divide it into multiple concurrent tasks and, and distribute that into a cluster of machines that do the job, and then you assemble sort of a map reduce type of uh, uh, type of scenario. And this is uh, this is super interesting to do when you're doing this, when you're doing training at scale. Because if you have like a hundred models trying to be trained at the same time using the same uh, infrastructure, is uh, is incredibly uh, is incredibly hard to uh, incredibly hard to scale. Uh, lesson number six. I mean, this is a very common one. Feature extraction can become a reusability nightmare. So here's a scenario. 
you have different data science teams working on different things. Uh, one of the team is using a data set. When you're building a model, one of the first things you do is to extract the features of the model that, that give, of the data set, I'm sorry, that give you the, the characteristics uh, of the data set. Then another team comes along and they're building uh, a new model that is using uh, the same data set and they go and do the same, uh, the same thing all over again. Because there is no way to say, hey, look, this, these features are the, the ones for this data set, and this is what this team did, and this is the time the, they did it, and this is the guy who led the team, and all those things. And feature extraction is not that it's the most complex uh, thing to do, but when you mul multiply that complexity across many, many uh, different data sets, many, many different models, it becomes, uh, it becomes a nightmare. So the best practice here is to build what we call a feature uh, store. So typically take, uh, you take a data set, maybe using uh, models such as techniques such as representation learning, which is a classic technique for extracting features about the model. Essentially it's, a, it's a representation learning focuses on learning the representation of a, of a data set. You extract the features, you put that in a store, and a centralized store, and then the different models would read from it. Uh, Cassandra is a very popular way to, to implement this. Any key value store uh, for, uh, for that matter scales and, and, and is uh, well suited uh, for, this type of, uh, for this type of scenario. So lesson number seven. Everyone wants a different version of, of your model. So let me walk you through a scenario that we, uh, uh, that we recently run into with one of, our, uh, one of our customers. So you have a model that is, uh, that is doing predictions, let's say uh, based on macroeconomic data uh, for different countries, predicting price of a, specific, uh, of a specific goods. And the model is working beautifully. Uh, so beautifully, then another team looks at it and they said, hey, uh, you know, we want that model, but we want to we wanna specialize it on this market. And you're, okay, great. You know what that means? You need to retrain the whole thing all over again for that, uh, for that data set. And then you multiply that by five or six different divisions, and you have data scientists screaming at you uh, next day. Because essentially what you're doing is recreating the same model over and over and over again. And for a while, I didn't find any good solutions for this problem. It happens all the time. Until I run into the, what the Salesforce.com team is doing with Einstein. So if you think about this, Einstein is this platform in which uh, Salesforce.com users can create variations of a model. So let's say, uh, price forecasting, that's a model, but every Salesforce.com instance is, is different. So they've run different variations of that model and the Einstein platform is, is able to, to do that, to accommodate that. And I started thinking like, how in the world they do that? And we, you know, I talked to the team and I found out a couple of other things. And then, uh, you know, I started recreating that technique and, and, and taking credit for it, which I'm very good at. Um, but no, the, the, self, the Einstein team recently open sourced uh, part of the Einstein stack uh, in, a, in, a, in a library called Trasmography. I wrote a, an article uh, about this. And essentially what they do is they use AutoML, which is a popular uh, language for self-service machine learning created by Google, to, uh, which AutoML is good for doing simple things in machine learning, but you cannot do too many, uh, anything totally relevant. Uh, that is sophisticated with AutoML, but what you can do very easily is create variations of a model. So if you think about, uh, you start with a training set and, uh, and, and you, you create a model for that, then you can partition that training set into specific data sets based on a specific categories and use AutoML to create uh, partitions or, or, or different variations of that model for a specific training set. And that seems to work very well because it's uh, computationally inexpensive. And essentially the maintenance is, uh, is super easy because you're essentially uh, training and regularizing this model uh, and, and, uh, and that you know, cascade into the, into the specific versions of the, 
of the other models. And now that they open source transmogrify, it's become even, uh, even simpler. So this is another lesson that we've run into it all the time, right? When you're doing deep learning at scale, if you have the luxury of living in a cloud environment, that's fantastic, right? Uh, there is a ton of the tool set in cloud technologies like uh, Azure ML or Google Cloud ML or SafeMaker is miles ahead of anything we have on premise. Uh, you have elasticity. There is a lot of dev to dev DevOps tools, uh, but we work in a lot of regulated industries, so many companies don't have this luxury and you need to deploy um, on pre uh, the machine learning models on premise, which are incredibly hard uh, to scale and the infrastructure is complex and you need a lot of DevOps uh, processes. So you cannot avoid that. I mean, you have to do it, but something that we recommend here all the time is do your experimentation and development on the cloud if you can, if you can, and then on premise, focus on building clusters of things like a Spark or Flink. Rely on heavy, massive parallel computation engines and know how to run uh, compute models. So Spark and Flink are the two favorite options here. So a common scenario is that you take ten a TensorFlow program, you uh, pilot it on, in Jupyter, take, you implement it in TensorFlow, you run it on SageMaker, works well. Uh, you take that code and run it then in TensorFlow on a Spark. And that uh, that works really well. It's not ideal. You still deal with a lot of headaches, but you know it's better than trying to do development and testing and uh, optimization all, all on premise with uh, uh, without the without and uh, not taking advantage of the cloud tools. Again, this seems obvious. Trust me, it's not. Like we learn a lot of these things the, uh, the hard way. Uh, so regularization, optimization are a must. So many times teams, uh, if, if you're, I'm sure you're familiar with this, optimization is a process of uh, essentially uh, reducing the cost function of a model. Regularization is a process of tuning hyperparameters. Uh, for a model, many data scientists think about this after the fact, oh, I create a model and now I'm going to go through this, is a never ending thing. So. You create a model, you regularize, you optimize, you tune the model, regularize, optimize, test it, regularize, optimize, it never ends. So, and the, the funny thing is, as, as you start testing the models with new data sets, you're gonna have to be tuning the hyperparameters uh, all the time. Thankfully, in the last few months, there have been a couple of great tools for hyperparameter optimizations that have come into the market. Uh, Comet ML is one we like. Weight and Bias is one that OpenAI is using that we like uh, a lot. SageMaker launched their hyperparameter optimization. The lesson here, the lesson in the, at this point is nothing crazy. Just think about regularization and, and optimization as part of your dev life cycle. It has to be there together with training and, uh, and model uh, development. I know it's obvious. I cannot tell you how many times, you know, people ignore it just and focus on creating the models and they never think about how are they going to monitor and tune these hyperparameters. Here's another one. You deploy a model to production. How do you, know, how do you uh, optimize the performance of that model over time? This is not like uh, monitoring software that you configure with New Relic and you're done the behavior of these models is going to vary very quickly based on the data they're processing. So you need to be regularizing uh, all the time. So lesson number 10, different models require different execution patterns. Here's what I'm referring to. If you look at most of the um, uh, our, uh, deep learning platforms, uh, not frameworks, the, the runtimes, out there, they have this pattern that you create a model, you expose it as, as an API and, and, and you consume it. Well, you know, it actually doesn't work that way in the in the real world. Many, many scenarios, these models take a very long time to run. Uh, in many, many scenarios, you need to execute different models based on a specific uh, data set. And there are some scenarios in which you do on-demand real-time access. So the, the solution here is, Let's use lessons from distributed computing that we have had for a long time and, and built an infrastructure that allows different activation patterns for machine learning models. So if you have models that need to run on a schedule, well, guess what? You package it as a Docker container, you put it in a container service, 
and that run, and use your favorite Chrome scheduler to run on a scheduled basis. If you need to execute models that run on top uh, on demand, that's a classic. You generate an API based based on that broker with your favorite API gateway, and you're in business. If you want to use models that you that are based on top pops up. Uh, uh, message patterns, then you set up an event gateway, pick your favorite one, S uh, SNS, Azure Service Bus, RabbitMQ, whatever you, whatever your flavor of the month is, and you uh, you listen to those models and you execute your Docker container package uh, with, with the models based on that on that activation pattern. And th there are others, but a schedule on demand, and publish subscribe are the three that we see all the time. So those are the three that we typically recommend companies to uh, to to look for. Then I actually just wrote about this uh, today. Uh, debugging uh, deep learning models is a nightmare. So any vanilla deep learning model could have millions of nodes and hundreds of hidden layers. Is at a structure like incredibly complex. Then. So interpretability is a big deal. So you most of the time, 90% of the time, you cannot tell quite how a model is making a decision. It's really hard to interpret. But then it, there is this interesting friction between accuracy and interpretability. So the models that are very inter interpretable, they're not very accurate. They're the simple models, the linear regression models. So a linear regression is completely interpretable because you can just backtrack uh, the entire execution to it, it, its origin. But most of the recurrent neural networks, uh, the convolutional neural networks, the generative, those are very hard to, to interpret. Then there is the unpre unpredictability factor, the fact that deep learning models change on behavior. So they, they add new nodes, there are new connections that are formed all the time and the behavior changes. And then the third factor is the tool set for uh, doing this type of thing is, is very primitive. You have things like TensorBoard and all that, but they're very basic compared to, compared to what you need. So here's what we, uh, what we propose. Uh, let's focus on this pyramid first. On the right. So Google recent Google Research recently published a paper called "The Factors of Interpret" or "The Building Blocks of Interpretability." Google it, Google it, right? And uh, and they propose they essentially study a bunch of models and they uh, they narrow it down to three factors that uh, uh, that should be taken into account to improve the interpretability of the model. One is uh, understanding. The activations, how nodes are activated, uh, right? Understanding what each hidden layer do, and understanding how the different comps that are formed. So, if you're doing image recognition, uh, what recognizes a color versus a region of a face or or a specific type of how comps that are formed in the model? If you can narrow those down those three, the model is more interpretable. Now, how do you do that in? Uh, in practice, so you use tools like TensorBoard and uh, an instrument, the heck out of the uh, the models. Uh, you typically, we typically recommend paying attention to those two things: training and test effort. So you you go through a training phase, there is a training effort. You go to the test phase, there is a test effort. When you have a high training effort, typically that's a sign of overfitting. But if you have a high test effort and a low training effort, that's, a, I'm sorry, when you have a, a high training effort, that's underfitting, you couldn't do anything. But when you have a high test effort and a low training effort, that's a sign of overfitting. So you need to pay attention uh, uh, to those two. Then for testing, we always recommend partitioning the data set in very small uh, data sets. So you can start narrowing down with data sets that you know exactly the composition, how, how the, how the next, uh, uh, the network is behaving. So it's a, it's a, you're optimizing for different cognitive factors. If you understand the data set, you can probably understand the behavior a little bit better and always monitor the gradient values across the different, uh, across the different hidden units. So if you're going to use a stochastic gradient descent, you just monitor those gradient values across, uh, across the different layers. So lesson number 12. If you're gonna do mobile and deep learning, I spoke briefly about this in my previous uh, uh, in my previous session. 
uh, this is way more complex than you actually think. If you're gonna deploy models in, uh, in, 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 in mobile devices, the traditional approach here is, oh, you develop this on the cloud, deploy it on the cloud, you build an expose it via an API, you write a mobile app that calls the API and gets a result. That's awesome if you have 100 users. If you have 10 million, that model doesn't scale. What's more important, as the model grows with more data, it becomes slower to, to execute. So you have latency factors, you have all sorts of things uh, to consider. Great, so then we have technologies like TensorFlow Lite now that allows you to build models that run on mobile devices. Problem solved, right? Anybody with, a, with knowledge of TensorFlow can write a model that, and then uh, compile it to, to a structure that actually runs on mobile devices. The problem with that approach is the model will run on your mobile device, but the whole point of making uh, a deep learning structure is that it actually gets better over time. So you need to share the result with something, right? right? Like a centralized uh, server so other instances of that mobile app benefit from that knowledge and that has privacy challenges. Uh, you don't wanna be sh sharing your data uh, with, uh, with a Google or, or somebody else. So Google recently came up with this approach called federated learning that works beautifully. And I explained in my previous session, which essentially what it does is you take a model, you deploy it to, to multiple mobile devices, the models run, uh, federated learning is going to compute the gradients of that model, the deltas, push that gradients to the cloud, not the data, uh, the gradients. Then it's going to, the model is going to retrain based on the gradients for every single instance, create new models and deploy that to update the, mo the, the models on the device uh, with the new models until you achieve uh, uh, decent levels of, of uh, performance. So it's, a, it's an approach that works really well. There are implementations for TensorFlow and things like that. If you're building uh, deep learning models that run on mobile devices at scale, the centralized approach gets questionable. You start running into all sorts of issues there very quickly. Lesson number 13, we have two more to go. Data curation is the best investment you didn't think about. Da bad data is everywhere, right? So you have data that is a duplicate, that is missing, that is inaccurate, that you don't know who maintains this. It's, it's really hard to get uh, accurate data. And typically we don't think about this because for our first deep learning project, we have an awesome data set that was perfectly curated. The whole thing was a success. And when you start scaling from there, nobody actually thought that we were going to get bad data and who, you know, how we, the techniques that needed to be in place in order to curate that. So that's uh, as part of the, your deep learning pipeline, that's something that we uh, recommend. So you're going to have data that is spread across all sorts of systems. Uh, uh, curating the data requires a ton of work. Nobody knows who owns what data set and, uh, and uh, what are, what's the schema and what are the semantics of the data. So there is a new generation of data quality technologies such as TAMR, Trifecta, Alation, Paxeta. These type of technologies are very good on taking a data set and actually using machine learning to curate it. So they look for things like missing values, incorrect uh, values. They come with data catalog. Uh, most of them, Alation and Tamara are very good on the data catalog. Uh, from they do data lineage analysis, all sorts of things. They're inexpensive. Some of them are even free. Uh, so we typically recommend, let's put some of these building blocks in place since the very beginning. You connect those to the line of business system. Somebody's looking at this structure. They can curate the data. You push those updates to the data lake, and then the machine learning models are happily dealing with high quality data. But this link is always missing. So typically you have data coming from your Salesforce.com to your data lake to the machine learning models. And before you know it, the environment is all corrupted and there are no ways to curate it, uh, to curate the data accurately. And data quality is something that has been around for a while and none of the technologies uh, experience uh, wide adoption. So you have things like SQL Server data quality servers, all those things are a disaster. 
and they were a disaster because they require a lot of manual work. They require somebody to be in front of an Excel-like interface curating data. And, you know, after a month, they forgot about it and data got all bad again. This type of technologies, they seem to do a better job because they automate about 60 to 70 percent of the process using machine learning. So a lot of the traditional data quality issues, they, they figure it out automatically. You don't have to be dealing. Uh, you don't have to be dealing with that. So this is a funny one. In machine learning projects, in our experience, neither Agile nor Waterfall works very well. If you know what works, please send me an email because I would love to uh, I would love to know. So this is what we have experienced so far. Waterfall methods don't know, don't work very well because you actually need to give the data scientists a lot of time to figure out what methods work for a specific problem. If you're trying to do uh, uh, you know, a classification problem, well, what algorithms are you gonna use? What architecture of the neural networks? How are you going to optimize? How many hidden layers? How many? So all those things need to be figured out. Typically, you, you test a bunch of models to try to arrive uh, to a conclusion. There is no magical answer that for this problem, this is a method that performs uh, the best. It always depends on the composition of the data set and a million other factors. And then agile methods don't work very well because you actually do kind of need specific requirements for a model. If you think about it, right? You need to know this is the data. This is what we're expecting on the other side. This is what you should see. You need certain level of uh, of uh, specificity there. So the whole will figure out two weeks at a time doesn't quite uh, doesn't quite work. So the answer is we have no idea right but here's something that we sort of uh think that uh, we seem to have had some minor success with so if you take the life cycle of a model and i presented it as a as a, as a linear uh structure for the sake of the image but it's more like a cycle um so the experimentation part you can run it as an agile exercise the data scientists need to be uh, uh, experimenting with different models until they arrive to something that actually works. The implementation, training, and testing, that's pretty waterfallish uh, type of thing because they you need very specific requirements and very specific expectations on time frames on that. The regularization optimization is very agile again uh, because you're going to be tuning hyperparameters left and right until you, you arrive to something. So that's not much of an answer. What we do know is that if you do it all waterfall or you might be there for years, if you do it all agile, you might be running into a ton of issues uh, once you pass the experimentation uh, phase because you actually need to know the specific requirements for uh, for that model. Okay, final lesson, accountability and transparency. So you have a, a, a large organization, they're creating problems. Th these are things that we typically don't think about. The, let me give you a scenario that just happened the other day. Uh, you have a, we have a customer, they onboarded uh, a couple of new data scientists and they wanted to uh, retrain a specific model that somebody else have developed. So you're confronted with all this question, like who actually trained this model? When was it trained? What was the performance that I shift during training? What's a, uh, the hyperparameter tuning history? of this thing. So how do you keep track of all that? If you, if you have one team doing the same thing, it's not a problem. They all know each other. But if you have multiple teams working on this, you're onboarding developers, data scientists all the time. This actually matters, right? Having certain level of, uh, of accountability and traceability here. So what we uh, typically recommend is, is a very simple approach. Just keep a ledger. Uh, and some people go to the extent of using blockchain technologies for this to make it immutable. Uh, so there are no disputes of who did what, but it doesn't have to be. A database would do just fine. But every step of the way, every time there is a training process, every time the uh, training job runs, a regular, regularization job runs, every time a, a model is deployed, keep track of all those events. Right in a catalog, the same way that many companies build data catalogs, well, build your model catalog. Once you have more than four or five, you need it. So a little library that has all the models that, that, that are currently running in the organization, who owns it, who built it, what's the training history, what's the hyperparameter uh, optimization history, how do you test it, 
uh, and those type of things, and that will improve the agility of the teams over time tremendously. I cannot tell you how many times you spend hours on this stupid discussion. So, oh, but we already run this model with this hyperparameter configuration and it didn't work. I said, well, what didn't, why didn't you tell me that like a week ago? Uh, so uh, implementing that infrastructure is super simple. It doesn't consume, uh, it only consumes, you know, a few, a few days of work and it can pay off a lot of dividends in the long run in terms of the agility of, uh, uh, of, your, uh, of your data science uh, pipeline. So that's all I got. Let me summarize this real quick. Deep learning theory doesn't work in real world scenarios very well. So a lot of the research out there is two guys in a lab testing against very small data sets. They don't have to deal with scalability issues with data set changes all the time. It's a very self-contained environment. So a lot of the research that we, we spend a lot of time keeping up on working with universities and what they're doing, it's, it's really hard to apply in real world scenarios. You need to build a new type of infrastructure and architecture for this. You need to adapt your architecture to the life cycle of deep learning uh, solutions. Consider some of the patterns here and start very small and iterate. Like nobody has all the answers to this. This is a brand new world. Even the top, some of the creators in this space are trying to figure out how some of these things work. So start very small and iterate and, uh, and you will be successful. Uh, this is my contact info. You can drop me an email at jrinvectorq.com. Through my Medium blog, I write about AI almost daily uh, through my Twitter feed. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining. I hope you enjoy the talk. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. There's fantastic speakers and fantastic uh, content out there. And, uh, and I already lost my voice in these two sessions. So I hope you enjoy the, the rest of the show and thank you very much for joining. Mm -hmm.